John, Paul, George and Ringo are probably Liverpool's four most famous faces, but there are four faces held even dearer in a Scouser's heart. 220 feet in the air, the Liver Building clocks have kept the city's time for a hundred years. It, it is known as the Liver Building. Now this is in a way a little bit strange because it was built very, very quickly. It started in 1908. It's virtually ready by 1910. But in 1911, just before the formal opening in July, we get the two really crucial things happening. We get the arrival of the Liver Birds themselves to, to adorn the towers. And then we get the implementation of the world's largest electronic clock on the four faces of things and so on. And that was done on the 22nd of June, 1911. All very, very clever in an age before mobile phones, the internet or whatnot. I don't know how they did this, but the precise moment that the crown is put on George, the, the fifth head, the liver clocks start. And everybody assumed from that that, well, since Liverpool always regarded itself as second only to London, if London had Big Ben, Liverpool was going to have Great George. Uh, but of course, Liverpool being Liverpool and the People's Republic of Merseyside, they don't really want to be identified with the monarch, so it's the birds that they decide to go with. And so it's never known as Great George, always known as the Liver Building. Inside the Liver Building, some way up the 483 steps and 17 floors, hundreds of feet in the air, there's a blue door behind which the mechanics controlling the clocks are found. Here we are in the West Clock Room. Uh, we're about 250 feet above ground level. Uh, the West Clock Room houses three of the four great George clocks, so named after King George V, who was on the throne when the building was actually built. Um, the minute hands themselves on the clocks are 14 feet long and act rather like a sail. So when the wind's blowing very strongly, the three clocks can often say the different times. The clock faces themselves are two and a half foot in diameter, larger than the clocks in the House of Parliament. And uh, indeed, one of them was used as a dining table um, before it was installed by all the workmen um, who were involved in the construction of the building. In each clock face, there are 15 tonnes of ironwork and a tonne of opal glass, um, making a combined weight of 16 tonnes. Um, to get all four clocks up here in terms of 64 tonnes, uh, obviously, it was a massive feat of engineering and a great credit to the guys at the time. One of the main men tasked with keeping the cogs turning and great clocks ticking is Head of Maintenance John Waring, who has worked at the Liver Building for more than 11 years. Well, we're actually standing on the 10th floor of the Royal Liver Building in Liverpool at the moment. And there in the background is the north-facing clock, one of four faces. The actual face of the clock is glass, it's like an opal glass the hands on the clock, they're made of the sheet copper over gold metal. They actually weigh 500 weight for the pair. Stopped once in 75 years. Through the post office, they used to send a 30-second pulse to us, relay. And we didn't get the message. It stopped the message electrically coming through. So uh, it, we just didn't get the message because of a major fault in the city. If you look closely at the clock faces, the glass panes are different colours. John explains why. Uh, we're now behind the, the actual west clock face, where, as you can see, some of the panels have broken in the past and been replaced by, as you can listen, a perspex uh, sheet instead of the original glass ones. They've been broken by seagulls in the past, where they've just flown straight into it at some speed, may I say and shattered the glass. Of course, they won't break the perspex now, but a lot of the old ones are still the original glass from 1910-11. When the Liver Building chimes first sang out across Liverpool in 1953, the bells were described as a new voice in the city, but they aren't actually what they seem. They did intend to have bells, but uh, unfortunately the bells didn't transpire. Well, the room that we're actually in now would have held the, the, the bell that they were talking about. It was going to be a five-ton weight bell. So, it, although it would have held the bell, there was a lot more mechanism to go with it. And for one reason or another, as I say, they decided against that because it, it, would, it would have caused problems. Uh, and they went to it with all electronic, which was like, I mean, because it was the first electric clock in the country anyway, it stands to reason that, yeah, they could go electronic. It's a hammer action on a, a, like a piano wire with a pickup at the end 
which then transports up to the roof, big speakers on the roof, which then sounds like the bells. It first actually struck on the 11th hour, 11th day of the 11th month, and it was to commemorate the loss of life in the society of uh, well, people who lost their lives in the First and Second World War. There is two big plaques down in the atrium which have got names on it to commemorate that.